I'm here at UCLA attending this year's Nowruz festivities, which is the Persian or Aryan New Year that included plenty of musical performances and traditional costumes and dance. Marking the start of the spring season and thus new life and harvest, the March or vernal equinox marks a time of new beginnings since at least 4,000 years ago in ancient Mesopotamia. For the Babylonians, the first new moon following the vernal equinox, the day in late March with an equal amount of sunlight and darkness, heralded in the start of a new year. Most countries use the Gregorian calendar, first adopted by Pope Gregory in the 1500s, which sets January 1st as the beginning of the new year, and is currently in the year 2022. But in places like Iran and Afghanistan, the year is 1401, and Nepal and parts of India recognize the year as 2073. In Ethiopia, New Year's is celebrated on September 12th, while Israel recognizes the Jewish New Year, typically in September or October. One of the most well-known traditional New Year celebrations is the Chinese Lunar New Year, which is based on the country's historical Luni solar calendar and is often celebrated in February. And it's the lunar moon cycle when the sun and moon align, which repeats every 33 years. That is the astro-theological basis for when certain guarded esoteric rituals take place at the heart of the symbolism behind the 33rd degrees of certain secret societies, such as the Freemasons, which stretches back into prehistory. Of course, they don't reveal this at first. Instead, talking about Jesus and his 33 miracles or 33 litanies of the angels, but it is later that the esoteric symbolism is revealed in occult sects whose alchemical origins predate all Abrahamic faiths. All of this music and dancing got me hungry, so I decided to try to find something to eat. Lunch was catered by another person named Robert and included a soup called Asherashte made of spinach, parsley, cilantro, onions, beans, and noodles. The sandwiches were made from kotlet, which are meat patties, and of course, some Iranian tea, which is usually served strong and black. I can't say that it was the best that I've ever tasted, but then again, I'm quite spoiled when it comes to Iranian food. So all in all, it was pretty good, especially the soup. I came across some stilt walkers who dressed up as sprouting trees, signifying new life that comes with spring, which is reminiscent of the leaf-covered green man in other traditional folklore which is symbolic of spring and natural cycles involving death and resurrection. Robin Hood is a heroic outlaw in English folklore who, according to legend, was a highly skilled archer and swordsman. Traditionally depicted dressed in green, he is said to rob from the rich and give to the poor. Archetypes for the Robin Hood figure can be found among the Celts, the Romans, the Anglo-Saxons, and the Danes. Anthropologist Sir James Fraser relates the story of the ancient cult of Diana and the King of the Wood. He was the consort of the virgin goddess of the hunt who died only to return again as the greenery does each year. Fraser argued that the King of the Wood was a manifestation of the universal pagan archetype of the dying and resurrected vegetation god, whose rebirth was often acted out in springtime mock combat between the personification of summer and winter. Fraser gives several Germanic examples 
of this folk custom in which summer is clad in greenery and winter is clad in skins or fur. In the May games or uh, spring celebrations of the 15th and 16th centuries, Robin Hood acted as an archetypal personification of summertime. These games were celebrated at various times throughout the early summer season. Robin Hood was also strongly associated with the summer solstice or midsummer days, as well as on ancient Roman pagan festivals honoring Fortuna, the goddess of fate, on June 24th. The goddess Fortuna remained part of European midsummer festivities and customs into the Middle Ages. Anthropologist Margaret Murray proposed that paganism did not die out with the Christianization of Europe, but instead practitioners of what she called the old religion retreated in secret into the woods at night to continue their ancient rituals. Murray suggested that the witch craze in Europe was an attempt by the church to eradicate these last vestiges of the earlier nature religions. Murray claimed that deity worship in these cults was a horned woodland god that dated back to Paleolithic hunting cultures whom the medieval church equated with Satan. For Murray, the legend of Robin Hood was a veiled reference to the medieval witch cult in which Robin Hood was one of the names for the leader of a coven who was considered both priest and incarnate god. For centuries, mankind has symbolized natural growth and nourishment, cycling through year after year in forms of a green man. The history of Green Man symbolism reaches deep into the past. Painted, carved into cave walls, megaliths, cathedrals, and even Green Man folklore exist as modern-day archetypes. Since before the dawn of measured time, the Green Man has been about his business, not of war, but of accommodation to sustain long generations of farming cultures. To call it a physical cycle seems to limit its scope and universality. The Green Man is a watcher, watching over our gardens and homes all over the world. The earliest lore dates back 600 centuries to 4000 BC. Around 4000 BC, during the warm Atlantic period, the Indo-European language was spread with the construction of stone observatories like Stonehenge becoming a continental utility, just as the English language is now spread through the global utilities. Following food and crops, cattle rustling northern Celtic culture traveled the Andronova Corridor, merging with the goddess's agricultural way of life. The green man is a farmer. Heretofore farming had been predominantly a feminine activity, the green man combines mother nature with male features, symbolizing the steppe warrior becoming a plowboy, a male farmer. There are countless numbers of these green man symbols found all over the world, dating back thousands of years. The green man is ever-present, everywhere. The green man is a proliferous symbol still used today. Popular characters Pan, or Puck, and Bacchus, all are from European centuries long past. Peter Pan, even the Jolly Green Giant, and yes, the Incredible Hulk, can be traced back through the Green Man. The Jack of the Green figure is associated with new growth in spring and with May Day celebrations. New images or old, the symbol of the Green Man lives on. Thousands of years, hundreds of generations have added and subtracted from his meaning, but one thing remains. As long as humans walk the earth, the green man will be watching. The green man is found in many forms throughout history, but the common feature is the face covered by foliage, very often sprouting from the mouth. He is often found carved inside medieval churches and cathedrals, 
a bridge between the new beliefs of Christianity and the pagan beliefs it replaced, etched in stone by Masons. The name Robin comes from the Norman Robert, a form of the Germanic version which originally meant famous or bright or even to shine. This is and always has been an indication of one who has achieved illumination or enlightenment. Horns were also symbolic of enlightenment or illumination and green a symbol of resurrection and life or the natural cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. The Robin Hood legend provided, in effect, a way for the ancient pagan fertility rites to be introduced back into Christian Europe. Every May Day, there would be festivals with pagan rituals enacted around the Maypole, a traditional symbol of the archaic goddess of sexuality and fertility. On Midsummer's Day, every village virgin would become metaphorically Queen of May. May Day would be, in fact, a day of orgy. Nine months later, it would produce throughout Europe its annual crop of children. Of course, many Europeans do not recognize spring as New Year's, but instead as Easter time, which gets its name from the goddess Ostara, the ancient Germanic goddess of the spring, whose female name of English origin means dawn or bringer of light of course the light bringer is also known as lucifer which means light bringer in latin the name of the planet venus personified as a male figure bearing a torch whose greek name for this planet was phosphorus also meaning light bringer but can be traced back to ishtar the babylonian goddess also the light bringer who, like the Sumerian Inanna before her, was the goddess of love, fertility, war, and sexuality. Her cult was the most important one in ancient Mesopotamia, and under various names became the most important goddess of the Near East and Western Asia. Of course, the King James Bible translates Morning Star as Lucifer, son of the morning, which brings us back to spring. Following the advent of Christianity, the Easter period became associated with the resurrection of Christ. In the first couple of centuries after Jesus' life, feast days in the new Christian church were attached to old pagan or Aryan festivals. Spring festivals with the theme of new life and relief from the cold of winter became connected explicitly to Jesus having conquered death by being resurrected after the crucifixion. In 325 AD, the first major church council, the Council of Nicaea, determined that Easter should fall on the Sunday following the first full moon after the spring equinox. There's a defined period between March 25th and April 25th on which Easter Sunday must fall, and that's determined by the movement of the planets and the sun. In most countries in Europe, the name for Easter is derived from the Jewish festival of Passover, which is also really tied to astrotheology. So, in Greek, the feast is called Pascha, in Italian, Pascha, in Danish, it's Pasch, and in French, it's Pakkes. ancient times, long before the Abrahamic religions, we encounter a world where for millennia people worship the benevolent goddess who is fertile, wise, intuitive, and above all, sexual. 
Today we have profound difficulty associating sexuality with anything sacred, but in ancient times, the worship of the goddess was often conducted through sexual rites, where carnal acts conducted in a specific way, which in modern times is most commonly referred to as Tantra, allegedly can lead one to enlightenment, which is often called Gnosis, and also has an equivalent Gnostic state that is revered by Sufis, Kabbalists, Taoists, or Tibetan monks, shamans, Wiccans, alchemists, mystery school religions, and various occult organizations collectively known as secret societies. That said, sexually induced trance states are also attained in mystic Christianity, but is obviously considered heresy by mainstream churches. In antiquity, these altered states of consciousness were experienced through the aid of a sacred prostitute or priestess whose job it was to awaken the kundalini serpent, which is another way of saying arousing the central nervous system and activating the pineal gland in the brain. In ancient Mesopotamia, the lands known as Sumer, Assyria, and Babylon, from the 4th millennium BC, a high priestess enacting the role of Inanna would unite or marry the young, virile, vegetation god in a public sexual ceremony that not only celebrated the fertile renewal of the land, but was also a ritual act of creation. This important festival would last for many days and would occur around the time of the equinox. The celebrations would include the ritual sacrifice of grains and fruits, including the first offspring of livestock, and blood would be offered to increase the fertility of the union, which was the culmination of these ritual celebrations. Within the ritual sacred marriage, the high priestess of the temple became the earthly embodiment of the goddess herself, joining with the masculine in the form of the king, and this represented the joining of the elements of earth and spirit to create a holy sacred union. Here, sexuality was experienced as a pathway to the divine, and on a spiritual level, a rebirth of the subtle energetic body, or the soul. In his book, Morals and Dogma, 33rd degree Freemason Albert Pike says, quote, Lucifer, the son of the morning, is it he who bears the light, and with its splendors intolerable blinds feeble, sensual, or selfish souls? Doubt it not. Supporters of Freemasonry assert that when Albert Pike and other Masonic scholars spoke about the Luciferian path, or the energies of Lucifer, they were referring to the morning star, the light bearer, the search for light, the very antithesis of dark. Though associated with Satanism, Luciferianism differs in that it does not revere the devil or the prince of darkness, but the virtuous entity representing light and various interpretations of the morning star, as understood by ancient cultures, such as the Greeks and Egyptians. In this context, Lucifer is a symbol of enlightenment, independence, and human progression, often used interchangeably with similar figures from mythology, such as the Greek titan Prometheus, or certain esoteric interpretations of the Jewish figure Lilith. Lucifer is primarily conceived of as an archetype, a representation of divine knowledge, or gnosis, as well as humanity's savior, and a champion for personal spiritual growth, development, and immortality of the soul. There are certain sects of theistic Luciferians that do believe Lucifer is an actual deity, and they are generally followers of what is commonly referred to as the left-hand path. This terminology is used in various groups involved in the occult and ceremonial magic, and in antiquity the left-hand path was symbolized by the color red. So, this means certain sects that were collectively referred to by the Greeks as Phoenicians, 
not to mention demographics pertaining to the Mycenaeans, Etruscans, Minoans, ancient Egyptians, Canaanites, certain Native American tribes that are now extinct that were called redskins because of the red ochre paint they applied to their skin, some Viking and Scandinavian people, such as the Danes, certain tribes of Aryans who spread out into numerous civilizations, and last but not least, a specific segment of people of the Pleistocene, the Greeks and Egyptians called Atlanteans. While most people that have heard of the term left hand and right hand path tend to oversimplify the meaning to denote good guys and bad guys, I would suggest that this is a myopic viewpoint and propose that the left hand path is more about embracing the dark as well as the light in order to transmute negativity into desirable qualities. This usually involves a rejection of social convention and the status quo and implementing techniques that are traditionally viewed as taboo, such as participating in orgasmic states of Tantra, using esoteric sex magic, and indulging in ritualistic drug use. In addition, this sometimes included the consumption of human ecstatic secretions, as well as blood, which is the true revelation behind the outstretched tongue of the goddess Kali, which is always extended and bright red. In an ancient Aryan context, which are at the root of esoteric Hinduism and Buddhism, the right and left path are viewed as equally valid approaches to enlightenment, with the left-hand path being considered faster, but also considered more dangerous and not suitable for all initiates. That said, the left is usually associated with the goddess. According to the Encyclopedia of Tibetan Symbols and Motifs, quote, In Buddhist Tantra, the right hand symbolizes the male aspect of compassion or skillful means, and the left hand represents the female aspect of wisdom or emptiness. In both Hinduism and Buddhism, the goddess is always placed on the left side of the male deity, where she sits on his left thigh, while her lord places his left arm over her left shoulder and dallies with her breast. In representations of the Buddha image, the right hand often makes an active mudra of skillful means, the earth touching, protection, fearlessness, wish granting, or teaching mudra, while the left hand often remains in a passive mudra of meditative equipose, resting in the lap and symbolizing meditation on emptiness or wisdom. Tantra uh, etymologically derives from a word rep meaning to extend, and to stretch. So essentially the Buddhist tantras, which were a set of texts that appeared in India between the 6th and the 10th century, were methodologies, practices, as well as sort of a philosophical view that differed quite distinctly from earlier forms of Tibetan monasticism. And they were ways of bringing about uh, methods that included sensuality, uh, the senses in a much more dynamic way on the, on the spiritual path. Many of the objects that we see in Tibetan art are in what is called yabyum, which is literally a uh, conjoined uh, sexual embrace that symbolizes not just the unity of sensuality on the spiritual path, as is commonly seen, but more importantly and esoterically, it's the union of opposites in, the, in a kind of Jungian sense, if you will. Also in Tibetan art, not only do we see figures in entwined sexual union, but we also see them manifesting very fiercely and wrathfully. So generally the purpose of these wrathful tantric deities is to cut through the, the conceptual mind. While most of the remnants of ancient Buddhist and pre-Buddhist influences have been erased from Iran by the Islamic Arab invaders that conquered it centuries ago, 
It was from this region that the original Aryan philosophy to which Gautama Buddha himself subscribed to originated from and was then disseminated to three quarters of Asia. That said, many of the ancient esoteric Aryan techniques that Buddha incorporated into his own philosophy have survived despite Islam in certain Sufi sects which are denounced by mainstream Muslims yet tolerated enough to have not yet completely lost their arcane mystic techniques. While most people already know that Buddha himself was born into Aryan nobility 2500 years ago, Bodhidharma was a Buddhist monk who lived during the 5th and 6th century, credited as the transmitter of Zen Buddhism to China, and regarded as its first Chinese patriarch. According to Chinese legend, he also began the physical training of the Shaolin monks that led to the creation of Shaolin Kung Fu. The anthology of Patriarchal Hall identifies Bodhidharma as the 28th patriarch of Buddhism in an uninterrupted line that extends all the way back to the Buddha himself. Throughout Buddhist art, he is depicted as profusely bearded, with wide eyes, and is referred to as the blue-eyed barbarian in Chinese Chan texts. While this is disputed by some party members of the current communist regime in China, this is the same political party that tries to hide their ancient pyramids by planting trees on them and makes analysis of 4,000 year old, 6 foot 6 inch tall blonde Chinese mummies with Caucasian features inaccessible to Western anthropologists such as myself that cannot be bribed or intimidated. We have, as modern human beings, a preconceived notion about how the world should look like. Well, the mummies from China don't look like they should be in China. They look like they should be in Denmark or Ireland or northern Germany because they look like people from over there. So what are these guys doing so many hundreds, thousands of miles to the east? DNA steps up to the plate and they can tell us where they came from. What are these people doing there? So long ago, well before the opening of the Silk Road, which is dated to 138 BC, these mummies date back, some of them, to 2000 BC. And there's no lying about it. In your books, you might say you're from another place, but your genetics will tell us exactly where you're from. The uh, female mummies were mostly of local origin. However, there's another type of testing, the Y chromosome testing, which is the male line. The males came from parts further west, not necessarily Ireland, but places like Iran, maybe towards uh, parts of Turkey. The mom's side and the grandmother's side is from the Tarim Basin, and the father's and the grandfather's side were moving in with their sheep, with their herds, slowly but surely, and having families, living their daily lives. So that is an additional aspect that the archaeological part to some extent corroborates, but doesn't tell in that great a detail. And that's the wonderful thing about DNA testing. Although the information has been suppressed, alternative explanations to the communist version of Chinese history has been available for some time. As early as the 17th century, a Roman Jesuit wrote about the Chinese pyramids. And in 1785, the French Orientalist Joseph de Gignes wrote an article called An Essay in Which We Prove the Chinese Are an Egyptian Colony. Keep in mind that in this context, Egyptian does not mean the modern Islamic civilization and demographic that occupies North Africa in modern times, which is very different culturally, ethnically, and genetically from the ancient Egyptians who built the pyramids in ancient times. Despite widespread Afrocentric propaganda in the United States and European academia and media, the ancient Egyptian nobility, pharaohs, and mummies are predominantly comprised of red-headed and blonde Caucasian people, as can be attested to by the mummies themselves, which not only have Caucasian facial features, such as the high nose bridge, cheekbones, and lack of prognathism, meaning how far the mouth sticks out from the face, 
which any real anthropologist can visually distinguish from sub-Saharan phenotypes. But the DNA also shares affinities with Aryan or Western European genetics, depending on the period. Even the oldest remains found in Egypt, which date back to pre-dynastic times, which is now in the British Museum, nicknamed Ginger because of its red hair, so it's not only China that is hiding its true history, it's also the West that is guilty of teaching falsehoods in an effort to push a cultural Marxist political agenda. That said, Western archaeologists who are interested in learning the truth have, to this day, rarely been permitted to investigate the sites, and some have claimed photos show shrubs and even structures that have been deliberately planted or erected to keep the secret under wraps. Some archaeologists suspect that there are almost certainly lost emperors, treasures, and priceless artifacts buried below the mounds that would dwarf Howard Carter's 1922 discovery of Tutankhamun. The Aryan or Indo-European invasions or migrations were ancient movements of people that had domesticated the horse, the only demographic to do so during the Holocene, introducing the horse and chariot to places like Egypt and the African continent, as well as North India and the Indus Valley. They also spread large-scale agriculture to other parts of the world, which requires domesticated animals in ancient times, like the oxen and horses, which only they had, as well as the Proto-Indo-European language, at the root of Sanskrit, Tocharian, English, French, Spanish, German, and many other languages, including Farsi, the language of Iran. While much of these Indo-European migrations are documented in ancient stone cuneiform thousands of years ago, there are still many mysteries which modern academia is only now discovering and trying to come to grips with. Some of these discoveries, such as the Aryan mummies of China, are being discovered buried just below the surface, while other discoveries are being made much deeper underground. An ancient mirage beneath the desert. The underground city of Nushabad in Iran might not be as famous as that in Derinqui in Turkey or the Edinburgh walls in the UK, but it is as much of an architectural wonder. The three-story settlement is 23 meters deep and has a labyrinth of corridors, tunnels, canals, and chambers filled with the hidden passageways and booby traps. But perhaps the most surprising of all is its complex ventilation system. The U-shaped tunnels allow air from outside to circulate, making it possible for people to stay inside for long periods. The construction of Nushabad in central Iran dates back around 1500 years to the Sassanid Empire. But because it was discovered only recently, many of the city's secrets are yet to be unveiled. Strong engineering behind this structure. They dug the wells of 12 meters beneath the ground. Corridors take you to the rooms that people were hiding in. There are also tunnels for air circulation and drain water. At the end of each space, there is a narrow tunnel that links two different spaces. The hidden entrances were built under a tandoor or kitchen of houses. At the end of the tunnel, there is a well that is connected to the canal. This lets people access to water and it functions as air ventilation and purifying system. It was also used as a way to escape if the enemy could come inside the underground city. While some archaeologists like Zahra Saruhani try to uncover how the underground city was built, others are working on why. There are many theories on the city's origins, but the most widely accepted reason is that it was to ensure the survival of people in the area. As people here lived in an area often targeted by raiders, they carved out these chains of passage for cover during attacks. Nushabad had several gateways. Some of these were inside homes. And what often looked like just dry wells from a bow were in fact entrances to the underground city. Even if invaders found a way inside, they had to survive surprise attacks in these curving corridors 
or traps set in pits. All these were devised to stop intruders from reaching these chambers where civilians will take refuge. The underground city of Nushabad tells a story of resistance and a will to survive. Thousands of tourists every year come here to understand and experience it. Rasul Serdar, Al Jazeera, Nushabad. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon and through all other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description. Please subscribe for future updates. Leave your thoughts below. Have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.